And the angel said, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. For to you is born today in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim grace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and a longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a nest and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord God of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They climb from height to height, and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. Lord of God of hosts, hear my prayer. Hearken, O God of Jacob, 
Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The reading is from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope of which he has called you, what are the riches of his glamorous inheritance among, glorious inheritance among the saints, and who is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, 
listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only you can live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the ways of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Your love, O Lord, will take away my life. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So today we are invited, asked, to wrap our heads around two things that really defy our ability to do that. The first is, of course, the core message of Christmas. God shows up in all of God's fullness as a human being, just like you, just like me. Now that's hard enough, but today we up the ante. Try to imagine, because it actually happened, that human being as an adolescent. Adolescence is such a unique point in human life. It's this liminal period of so many neither nors. One is neither a child anymore, nor yet a fully full adult. One is neither completely dependent 
nor yet fully self-sufficient. And perhaps the biggest, and I'm sure any parent or teacher listening to this will resonate very much, perhaps the biggest challenge and tension of adolescence is the push-pull between obedience and disobedience. And as much as it boggles the mind, in today's reading, the one and only gospel account we have of any point in Jesus' life between his birth and infancy and his emergence as an adult rabbi, we see this tension between obedience and disobedience fully at play. <laughs> he was undoubtedly disobedient to his parents in staying in Jerusalem when they would have expected and assumed that he would join the caravan of travelers heading back to Nazareth after the festival. But then the scripture tells us that after this extraordinary encounter where they return to Jerusalem and find him in the temple, holding his own with the finest teachers and rabbis and scribes of the time, that he then did return to Nazareth with them and was indeed obedient. God struggled with this tension, this adolescent tension, between obedience and disobedience in his human life. That is really hard to wrap our heads around. But this story is unquestionably there for good reason. Because if we see Jesus navigating these tenuous waters, it must be for us a sign of how God intends for us to do that. And spiritually speaking, I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that we really, in some ways, spend our entire lives in adolescence. No human being can claim to have achieved really high and perfect spiritual maturity. And yet, we are quite capable of making significant progress. Hence, I would say we are adolescents. And this story has a great deal to say about how we might navigate our adolescent spiritual state in this chaotic and tumultuous place that we call our world. It's clear from the story that there's never a one-size-fits-all, clean-cut answer to the question of, are we obedient or are we disobedient? There are some pretty obvious answers to why this is the case. When parents or caregivers or others who love us caution us to not stick a knife in the electrical outlet look both ways before we cross the street. As we grow up, be careful of our surroundings and who we're spending our time with. Make sure we haven't consumed any mind-altering substances before we get behind the wheel. Obedience is probably not only a good idea, but the right and holy choice. But when it comes to being the confessing church in Nazi Germany, and not telling the truth when the SS officers come and act, ask whether there are Jews hiding in the attic, when it comes to being the civil rights movement led so thoroughly by the black church in 20th century America, in that case, I would suggest that perhaps disobedience is the right and holy choice. And isn't that precisely what we see playing out in today's story from Luke. There was this moment where disobedience to the earthly authority of his parents was indeed Jesus living in to his divine nature and his divine calling. And then there was also a moment where obedience was the proper choice. And this is what God puts before us today. We are living in a world that seems utterly maddening right now. There are voices screaming at us from every side, 
and using the tools of fear, of anger, of division, of frustration to try to tell us what we must think, what we must do, and to whom or what we must be obedient. And many of those voices are pulling in polar opposite, diametrically opposed directions. Well, as much as this might seem like a new phenomenon, it really isn't. I am certain that the world of Jesus' time, the world in which he sat on that day in the temple in Jerusalem, was no less maddening than ours is today. You had the Roman imperial authorities screaming one thing. You had the Jewish temple authorities screaming another. You had the poor Galilean farmers from places like Nazareth screaming yet another. And Jesus, 12-year-old adolescent Jesus, is right in the midst of all of it. And he has to discern whom or what to obey and whom or what not to obey. And the beautiful thing about this story, perhaps the most beautiful line of all, and we have to use our imaginations for the tone of voice and the affect, is the utterly calm and confident response that he gives to his mother Mary when she questions, why have you treated us this way? Why didn't you just come back with the caravan and the rest of the family? And he simply says, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? He wasn't rude. He wasn't confrontational. He wasn't insulting. He simply stated calmly and confidently that he knew there was a higher, the highest authority that was calling him in a certain direction, and he was going to answer that call with all boldness and clarity. This is the model that he sets for us today. He says, look at this maddening world. Be in it, but do not be of it. Recognize that there are places where it's appropriate, even godly, to obey the voices that are coming your direction, perhaps even if you don't want to obey them. But there are also places where it's appropriate, even godly, to disobey. And you can always do so with boldness, and calmness and confidence. The challenge is we must discern the Father's will. One of my favorite stories from the Old Testament is the one of Elijah standing at the mouth of a cave. Everything has gone wrong for him and the machinations of power are seeking his life. And God is about to reveal God's self to the prophet. And the prophet gets up and covers himself with a mantle and stands at the mouth of the cave and all kinds of spectacular natural phenomena happen. Great winds and fires and earthquake. And the scripture says God was not in any of it. And then there's a sound of sheer silence, a sound of sheer silence, something that has a power of its own, even though it's utterly silent. And in that is where he found the awesome power of God. Jesus encourages us to do the same. Sure, we're going to look around and see fires and earthquakes and wars and winds and all kinds of wild stuff. And chances are pretty good that God, at least the fullness of God, that voice that we can really trust is not in any of it. But if we can see past the chaos, past the fear, past the drama, to that place where there is a sound of sheer silence, that is where we can hear with clarity the voice of our Lord and Savior telling us what to do and what not to do. Do we stay in the temple? Do we go home? Do we obey the voice of authority? Do we disobey? I'm not here to tell you conclusively today the answer to any of those questions. 
I am, however, here to tell you that the answer is there. We just have to listen for it. So in this Christmas season, remember, God became incarnate in a world as wild and crazy as the one you and I are facing today. And God did so to show us a pattern and a model that we can follow, a model of a perfect life, of a life completely aligned with God's purposes, not one that calmed down all the chaos and voices around, but one that was able to hear the one voice that counts anyway. If it was possible for Jesus, it is possible with his help for us too. And that is what I encourage you to pray for this Christmas season, and that is my prayer for you.
Let us pray to our Lord, with joy to our Lord, saying, O incarnate word, hear our prayer. Incarnate Lord, we thank you for the church you have built here on earth to witness to your power and love. Thank you for your presence in the lives of all your faithful people. Today we lift up to you your blessing, all people and assemblies who gather in the divine name. We remember especially the Anglican Communion, including Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Anglican province of the Congo. We remember also the Episcopal Church in this land and our diocese, including Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, Holy Innocents Church in San Francisco, and Holy Innocents Church in Corte Madera. In our local community, we remember Celebration Church in Livermore. O Incarnate Word, hear our prayer. Incarnate Lord, we ask you for the vision you offer in your birth and radiant life of that day when every nation and people will live in perfect peace and harmony. Thank you for giving to all peoples, especially those in positions of public trust and power, a desire for that day and the will and means to help bring it about. We remember before you Joe, our president, Gavin, our governor, Bob, our mayor, and all those who serve in legislative assemblies or judicial roles in this and every land. Thank you for your guidance and providence over every nation and its leaders. O oh, incarnate word, hear our prayer. Thank you, incarnate Lord, for overcoming the world's troubles and fears. Thank you for keeping us focused on you during these troubled times and all the challenges they bring. We remember before you today all those who care for others in body, mind, and spirit. Thank you for pouring out your love and protection upon them and upon us all. O oh, incarnate word, hear our prayer. Incarnate Lord, we thank you for gathering this congregation of St. Bartholomew's together in awe of you and affection for one another. Thank you for the blessings you pour out upon us together and individually. We ask that you pour out a special blessing upon these members in our weekly cycle of prayer. For Andy, Olga, Lily, Abby, and Zachary, for Michael, and for Jean, as well as those in military service. We pray for Aaron, Joey, Abigail, Valerie, Amber, Christopher, Taylor, and Drake. O oh, incarnate word, hear our prayer. Thank you, O oh, Incarnate One, that you are our great physician. We thank you for the healing mercies you pour upon, pour into the lives of all who struggle in body, mind, or spirit. We remember before you all who have requested our prayers, especially Olivia, Angela, Olivia, Becky, Brett M, Kathy, Dave. Doris, Aaron, Esteban, Helga, James, Julia, Ben and Catherine, Kip, Linda, Marion, Marge, Marcia, Nina, Michael, Robert, Sally, Richard, Yvonne, Deacon Jennifer Nelson and family, 
the pain family, that they are more families. And for all those affected by the wildfires in Colorado. And I wish to wish well a happy birthday for our dear sister Erin. O oh, incarnate word, hear our prayer. Thank you, O oh, incarnate word, that in joining heaven and with earth, you have paved the way for us creatures of earth to enjoy you forever in heaven. We thank you for all your servants who have entered into your nearer presence, especially Rosalie, Glennis, Alex, Mark, John Madden, Dr. Shirley, Desmond Tutu, Betty White, and Harry Reid. May all the departed rest in paradise and rise on the last day to life immortal. O oh, incarnate word, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And now, O oh, incarnate word, with grateful hearts we offer you thanks for all the blessings yet unspoken that you have given us. And we bring before you with hearts and voices all of our prayer concerns. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting.
Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Amen.